recent media events have drawn a great deal of attention to traditional Catholics, most specifically the recent excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre. I'm Julius Smetona. Welcome to What Catholics Believe. Today, however, we'd like to focus not on the more controversial and polemical side of the issues involved in the traditional Catholic movement, but we'd like to just focus and see what does a traditional priest do, what do traditional Catholics believe, what are they like. With us today is the Reverend William Jenkins, pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Father Jenkins, welcome to our program. Thank you, Jesus. Father Jenkins, what is your, the nature of your religious vocation? What do you do? Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, of course, I offer the traditional Mass. I have my traditional bravery to pray. And uh, beyond that, uh, of course, perform the daily meditation and the spiritual reading and so on. But uh, I have apostolic work to do beside that. My personal assignment is to uh, school. I'm the principal of a school in Cincinnati. It's a traditional Catholic school. We still do things the old way. What is the name of your school? Uh, St. Gertrude Academy. How many students do you have? We have 140 students, mm -hmm. and they're from all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some boarding facilities there. Although the school has already become too small for us, and we have to expand. We have to look for a way to expand. I also uh, take care of uh, a parish here in Cleveland, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus another smaller parish in, outside of Columbus, Ohio, and a third parish in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, when people hear this, they say, in charge of a school in Cincinnati and three parishes, one in Cleveland, one in Columbus, and one in Louisville, Kentucky, how is this possible? Uh, well, it has to be possible because it's necessary. Uh, I work with a, an association of traditional priests, most of whom are quite young, and uh, we call ourselves the Society of St. Pius V. How many priests are in this association? Uh, there are 12 priests in this association right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are actually only a handful of traditional priests working in this country. There are many others, perhaps 200 or 200, 250 traditional priests working individually or in loose associations among themselves. Um, yeah, the recent events, uh, numerous people were quoted. The number I got was that there's roughly 25,000 people who follow the traditions, the traditional Catholic way in the United States. Would you agree with this rough estimate? It's very hard to put a number on it because there are those who attend the traditional mass centers, attend the traditional mass and learn, teach their children the traditional faith and so on. But there are many, many others who still have the traditional faith, but who cannot come because of distance to, let's say, a, a, a traditional mass center three or 400 miles away from them, or they're afraid to come because their local priest or bishop has frightened them away from the traditional mass. Uh, but they still do believe. They still have the Catholic faith. <coughs> now, because uh, even two or 250 traditional priests in a country is small, it's a small number compared to what we've been used to before Vatican II. These priests find everywhere uh, pockets, smaller or larger, of traditional Catholics around the country. And so one priest will find it necessary to offer Mass in a locale where he lives and then travel 100, 200, sometimes 500 miles to get to another traditional Catholic group and offer Mass for them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Some priests will travel to three or four different locations every Sunday offering the traditional Mass. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I travel, as I say, to Cleveland and Columbus and Louisville to offer the traditional Mass and then return Sunday night to my school in, uh, in Cincinnati and in there for the week. And then come Friday or Saturday again, I start traveling again. What would someone find, let's talk about your school a little bit, if someone went to your school, what difference would he see between your school and a typical parochial school, or for that matter, a public school? Well, I think one of the first things visitors notice 
in our school is the omnipresence of religious symbols. Uh, in the hallways, the crucifixes, the large statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a uh, seven-foot statue of Our Lady right inside the front door. Notice the, the portraits of St. Pius X, uh, uh, Pope Pius XI, Pope Pius XII. Uh, they notice uh, scenes of St. Peter's Basilica in our hallway of the school. Uh, they notice the, the very, very large painting of the Sacred Heart in our Sacred Heart Hall, which is the lunchroom and also the, uh, uh, the, the, the place where we have assemblies. Uh, they notice crucifixes everywhere throughout the building, in every classroom. And uh, I think what uh, really impresses many of the visitors is when they walk into the kindergarten classroom or the first grade classroom and they see the old uh, scenes depicting the mysteries of the rosary or the stations of the cross for children. They're, 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 they're taken back to the years before Vatican II and remember uh, what a beautiful, holy feeling there was in the classrooms of, uh, of long ago before the changes were made. What is your uh, educational philosophy at St. Gertrude's? Our educational philosophy is based upon the preventive system of St. John Bosco. St. John Bosco was the founder of the Salesian order or Salesian congregation. And uh, St. John Bosco applied through his Salesians this preventive system, as he called it, which is based upon reason, religion, and kindness. And so he did not believe in harshness or in ridicule directed toward the students when they did something wrong or made a mistake. He believed that in order to be feared with not a servile fear, the fear of a slave towards his master, but to be feared with the, with the fear a son has toward his father, you must first make yourself loved. And if you can make yourself loved by your kindness and by your justice and equity toward the students, then they will fear you as a son fears his father. It's a reverential fear. And his whole system is based upon that reverence <clears throat> that the teachers have to command. Of course, in order to really succeed in that system, you have to be a saint, or at least working towards it, uh, which was why St. John Bosco was so successful, and why others cannot make that system work. <clears throat> but that is the, the educational system we try to follow at St. Gertrude Academy. We still have our flaws, of course, and we don't apply it perfectly, but we're working on it. Mm -hmm. What, uh, how, how is this system met? When people come in and do you often have problems with children acclimating themselves to a traditional environment? Well, uh, we have to face the fact that the youngsters in St. John Bosco's time were very different from the youngsters in our own time. The youngsters in Don Bosco's time never heard rock music, didn't take drugs. Even if they were available, they couldn't afford them because St. John Bosco was working with youngsters who were living in the streets and who were orphaned or abandoned by their parents. And that's why when he was kind to them, it meant so much to them because no one else was kind to them. Uh, these children had never seen television. They had to eat uh, many, uh, often scraps out of the garbage. Um, they had to work long hours under harsh masters. They responded readily to his kindness once they saw that he really loved them. But you see, nowadays, we have a situation where youngsters are, are simply consumed with liberalism. They're spoiled very often. Their, their, their wildness is glorified by rock music and television and stereotypes that are given to them, role models that they follow. And so often, in trying to apply this preventive system, we are looked upon as the ogres because we expect them to follow rules. And nowadays, anybody who expects them to follow rules is a bad guy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's much more difficult now to appeal to the youngsters. We don't give them anything they want. We don't spoil them. And therefore, we're, we're looked upon as uh, the meanies. Mm -hmm. 
But anyway, we still have to try to appeal to what is best in the youngster. In any youngster you find, there's going to be some goodness there. And, uh, and you have to appeal to that and try to, to bring the best out of them. And this is what the preventive system is all about, and that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. What about in the, uh, the chapels you service? What would uh, someone who walked off the street find there as opposed to going down to the church down the street? What differences would he notice? Well, a first-time visitor to uh, St. Teresa's, for example, our parish right here in, uh, in, in Parma, I think would be first impressed by the silence He'd walk through the door, and he'd see people in the church, but they weren't talking, and they weren't laughing, and they weren't shaking hands or telling jokes. They would be either sitting in the pew reading or kneeling down, all facing one way, and toward the tabernacle, which is right on the altar, front and center. And I think that silence would impress them, because very often when one walks into a modern church today, he finds the people laughing and shaking hands and having a grand old time. Mm -hmm. but you see, there's a, there's a theological reason for the difference. Uh, uh, in the modern churches, their tabernacles are taken off to the side and put in a corner somewhere, most often. And there's a table up front, and everybody's turned toward that table. And uh, that's because they celebrate fundamentally a different kind of Eucharist than we do. Uh, when they say Eucharist, they mean the social Eucharist, the Eucharist of having uh, good interpersonal relationships and, and interaction on a social level. Uh, you see, at St. Teresa's, when we say Eucharist, we mean the Holy Eucharist, not the social Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist. And that is why we have our tabernacle on the altar, and the altar's in the center. That's the focal point of attention. There's no, there's no table or ironing board up front or any structure like that to get in the way. And all attention is focused on the real presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Blessed Sacrament, in that tabernacle, on that altar. What would they see once Mass begins? Once Mass began, they would see a priest with his back toward them, facing the altar just as they are. And they would see, they would hear the priest speaking in Latin. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Intro ibo ad altari Dei, ad Deum quilatificat juventud, Amen. That's what they would hear. For many of them, it would bring them back. Which says, I will go into the altar of God, the God who gives joy to my youth. Yes, exactly. That's the beginning of the traditional Mass. I will go unto the altar of God. Now, obviously, they can't say that in the new Mass because they don't have an altar anymore. They have a table. Um, the old-timers, those who were Catholics before Vatican II, would recognize that, and it would just sweep them back years before. The new-timers, that is the youngsters who were raised in this new religion, which, is, uh, which purports to be the Catholic religion but is actually an imposter, mm -hmm. would have no recollection of this whatsoever. They would consider this to be very strange and foreign. And this is what I, uh, one thing I find very, very sad, is that when we have uh, youngsters who consider themselves Catholics, are told that they are Catholics, come to the traditional Mass and see the Mass, they have no recollection of it whatsoever. It's like they're totally cut off from centuries and centuries of Catholic life. Mm -hmm. The choir sings the Panis Angelicus, beautiful hymn, the bread, the angelic bread of heaven, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. meaning the Holy Eucharist. Catholics who had been Catholics for 40 or 50 years would feel a certain uh, welling up in their hearts of, uh, of love. But the youngsters who come in for the first time uh, would not recognize that hymn at all. It wouldn't mean anything to them at all. Mm -hmm. um, but when the priest begins, begin mass at, begins Mass at St. Teresa's, those who ever saw the traditional Mass would re think, I, th I believe, this is home. Mm -hmm. I'm home at last. And say so would see the statue of the Sacred Heart, and say so would see the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary flanking the altar. Mm -hmm. And they would look at those and they would say, I'm home mm -hmm. at last, after a long exile. What about uh, the methods, say, of receiving the Blessed Sacrament? What would they notice upon coming in a church where you say Mass? 
Uh, well, the priest turns to them with the consecrated host and says in Latin, uh, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak only the word, and my soul shall be healed. And he, they say that three times. When you're saying they, the people say this, or the priest says this, or just... Uh, the priest says that, but this is the meaning. Speak okay. but the word, and my soul shall be healed. Of course, the people are, are meant to be speaking that in their hearts with the priest, and each one applying it to himself. And then they come up and take their places kneeling at the communion rail. And the priest comes down to them and gives them communion on the tongue. I, I will not place the host in the hand of anyone. Um, but I place the host immediately on the tongue of the communicant. And uh, the person then pauses for a moment, makes thanksgiving, and then goes back to his place. Now, before I give the host to someone, I face each one with a ciborium in my hand. That's the gold cup that holds the hosts. And I take a host for that person, and I make the sign of the cross in front of them, which is just like that person's own benediction. Remember the old benediction ceremony where the priest would take the monstrance and make the sign of the cross over everybody with the host? Well, that's what the priest does in the traditional mass. He takes the host in his fingers and he makes the sign of the cross over each person. And he says, may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve your soul to everlasting life. And then he gives him the host. Mm -hmm. And he goes down the line and gives each one the host with his own personal blessing with the, with the, with the host. And he comes back and he, he just goes uh, down the communion rail as many times as there are uh, as uh, no, no lay distributors of communion? No lay distributors of any kind. No, the priest distributes mm -hmm. every host that is given as Holy Communion. Uh, why wouldn't you, uh, why must they kneel? Why can't they stand or receive it in the hand? It's a simple form of reverence. Mm -hmm. A simple form of reverence. Mm -hmm. It's customary in the Latin rite to place oneself on his knees just as one used to in the old days before a great leader or mm -hmm. a great uh, uh, powerful figure. We are saying that this is our king. By kneeling down, we are saying, this is our king, and we kneel before him to receive him. What's, uh, in terms of personal behavior, what, uh, what do you expect of your parishioners? How would the expectations you have uh, of your parishioners differ from what is more generally expected of them? Well, obviously in church, we expect them to show reverence and respect toward the Blessed Sacrament. Um, when it comes to their comportment outside, we expect them to live up to their traditional Catholic faith. In the words of our Lord, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So we expect our people to keep the commandments. Uh, we as traditional Catholics are a minority right now uh, and are looked upon with a certain amount of suspicion. In a liberal society which doesn't like to be tied down to anything set or fixed, we believe there is not only a law that is to be followed, but that there is a law that must be followed by everybody. Mm -hmm. It's an objective law. And so we're looked upon with a certain amount of, of suspicion as though we're some kind of fanatics because we believe in an objective truth, an objective order to which everybody must conform his will. Mm -hmm. That's why traditional Catholics must not only be decent people, but they must be very good people. They must be exceptionally good. They can't afford to give scandal by their anger. They have to be patient. They have to be kind. They have to be chaste. That is pure mm -hmm. in their conduct. Even more so, uh, they'll, let's put it this way, they'll be held even more responsible for impurity or anger or selfishness and injustice because since they are traditional Catholics, they are scrutinized more closely by others who expect more from them. Mm -hmm. What about confessions? Uh, it seems that uh, currently there's not such a great stress placed on confession. What about you and your apostolate? Well, I and all of the other traditional priests who travel mass circuits going everywhere, we can or let's say everywhere we're asked to go to take care of traditional Catholics, always hear confessions before Mass on a regular basis. I mean, there may be times when our plane is late arriving and so on, but on a regular basis, routinely, we will have a confessional, 
And we will go there and hear confessions. And it will be a real confessional, mm -hmm. uh, where the people don't simply walk into a, to a, a nice room with a plant and two chairs and say, hi, how you doing, Father? <laughs> but they come in uh, behind the curtain, and they kneel down, and uh, when the priest is ready for them, they say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Mm -hmm. It has been so long since my last confession, and sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's 10, 20 years. It's very common nowadays. And the priest is accustomed to that, and he always tries to be helpful. And the penitent says, I accuse myself of the following sins. And uh, then the priest listens to what the penitent has to say. If the penitent needs help, the priest will go through the Ten Commandments with him and ask him specific questions. Well, did you do this? Did you do that? If so, how many times? As well as you can remember. And when it's done, the priest will say, well, give thanks to God for his mercy. Make a firm purpose of amendment to try to change the things that need to be changed to avoid committing these sins in the future. And ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to help you and give you the strength necessary to uh, stand firm against these temptations. Mm -hmm. And then for your penance, could be uh, the, the standard three Our Fathers, three Hail Marys, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the priest then gives absolution while the penitent is making the act of contrition. Mm -hmm. That's the way confession used to be. That's the way it is when it's given by one of our traditional priests. One of the uh, things which strikes me is that very often, or most of the time, uh, when one sees a funeral mass, there are white vestments, and I believe it is now called the Mass of the Resurrection. That's right. What would a funeral Mass be like in somewhere where you serve Mass? Well, like so many of these changes in the modern church, that white Mass was introduced as in a kind of experiment. But the experiment becomes standard, and everything else becomes uh, sort of the abnormal. At St. Teresa's, we follow the old Requiem Mass, where the black pall covers the, uh, the casket. And the priest does not give a eulogy, speaking of the, the, the greatness of the person who died, but rather of his soul and his faith and uh, how everyone should uh, now continue to love him and do for him uh, what a friend would do, and that is pray for his soul in mm -hmm. case he be suffering in purgatory and uh, to, to remember him mm -hmm. and always include him in your prayers. It talks about the meaning of death, the triumph of Christ, uh, in my sermons at the funeral masses, I always bring in the fact that here at our Requiem Mass, we don't have flowers on the altar, we have the black vestments, and it's very somber. I try to bring in the idea of the prodigal son, how the prodigal son returned to God, or returned to his father, in the rags of his sorrow and his humility. And the father was so moved by this sight of his son, uh, returning in, 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 in humility and in grief, that the father ran to meet him, threw his arms around him, wept for joy, and all was forgiven. And that's the way I think we return to God in death, and that's why the church has us offer the funeral masses as we do, because we recognize that what we are asking God in the Requiem Mass is himself. We're asking him to give the soul of the deceased himself, God, mm -hmm. to take the soul and unite it to God forever. And we realize we're not worthy of that, but that by the, by the sufferings of Christ on the cross, we dare to ask for it. We come in humility, protesting our unworthiness, but we are overwhelmed with the confidence in our Lord. That's the traditional requiem mass. Father, we spoke about death. Uh, there's also another major event in the lives of people is marriage. Uh, how would a marriage ceremony be different at your church, and how would the, the couple who is preparing for marriage, how would you prepare them? What would you tell them? Well, traditionally, uh, the married couple would receive six instructions of about 45 minutes each. Um, nowadays, because of distance, that's not always possible. Sometimes the priest gives one instruction for three hours. But regardless, the couple would be prepared for marriage, and it would be the traditional Catholic understanding of marriage, uh, with the husband being the head of the family, but also a man who must rule the family by love, who must sacrifice himself for the family, who must be worthy of the love of his wife by, uh, by his own goodness and his own faith and strength of character. 
and uh, the, the, the traditional Catholic idea of the woman being really the heart of the home and the children uh, being cultivated in a reverential fear of their parents mm -hmm. and uh, based on love. Uh, they would be taught all of that in the course of their instruction and uh, then when the traditional ceremony actually took place they would come before the aisle before the altar and they would exchange vows and they would not write their own ceremonies as is often does the ceremonies right there in the ritual as it has been for hundreds of years and the priest and they conform themselves to it and the priest asks them if they are willing to if they are offering to each other and then ask them to join their right hands and pronounce their acceptance of each other mm -hmm. And at that moment, they become married with that exchange of vows. Mm -hmm. And then the blessing of the rings, the exchange of the rings, then the Mass begins. Mm -hmm. The nuptial Mass is actually a thanksgiving and a consecration of the marriage that just took place with the two people kneeling directly before the altar. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, uh, getting back to an earlier question, what is the state of, of this traditional movement? This is probably the last question we have time for. You mentioned there's about 25,000. How loose is the association of these priests? Uh, do you have any other priests outside of your 12 that you work with, for instance? There are a number of other priests with whom we work. You see, we want to avoid giving the impression that we're setting up a new church. We're just priests doing what priests were always told to do by the church. That's all. And we have formed an association. Uh, for the sake of aiding each other in doing this. For example, our group of, uh, of 12 priests or so uh, serves some 50, 50 mass centers across the country from California to New York and down into Florida. Uh, that's a tall order. That's why we're working together so closely. Uh, we have a central schedule that we follow. But um, there are many, many other priests, traditional priests around the country working to maintain the traditional faith for the sake of those Catholics who still have the traditional faith. Father Jenkins, uh, it's been our pleasure to have you with us.